Um, I was raised in the Church of Christ. It's a denomination that considers itself non-denominational. Um, there are lots of different strains of it. You'll find some that um, are very, very strict and conservative, and others that are more liberal. But the ones, the one that I was raised in, tended to be more conservative, not the far end of the spectrum, but close. My dad was a preacher, um, and he he's a very good teacher and by the time I was eight I was baptized for the remission of my sins um I remember telling a lie that I got away with and no one knew it was me and so it weighed on my conscience pretty heavily um I remember having theological discussions with kids my age as early as kindergarten I remember telling a little girl that Jesus was coming back and she said well I'll be in Florida so I won't, I'll miss it. We lived in Kentucky at the time. And uh, I told I tried to get her to understand he's coming back for the whole world, not just Kentucky. Um, I was very vehement in arguing that baptism is necessary for salvation in high school. Uh, it caused kind of a, a bit of controversy with my friends who were mostly Christians, but you know, the what I would call the denominational type. Um... My parents loved me. I have no doubt of that. Um, and God loved me. But I, it, was a, it was an intellectual understanding. It was never a deeply felt um, emotional experience for me. So as a result for that, of that, I was pretty starved for affection my whole life. In the Church of Christ... The doctrine is elevated above everything else. Whether it's intentional or not, it is elevated. Um, the rules are what's important. You have to keep the rules because one sin will condemn you to hell. One sin. Because all sin is the same. Um, this creates an atmosphere of fear. Because no one can be perfect. But we're all trying to be perfect because we think that that's how... We'll get to heaven, and that's the only way we can please God. So it I was isolated for much of my life from people. I wasn't able to form deep, real friendships um, because we were all trying so hard to be perfect, and that necessarily means you have to hide your flaws, your faults. So I hid, and I tried, and I was alone for most of my life. And I was I tried so hard to be perfect and you just can't be perfect. Um I guess at age 31 things started to change for me. We moved. My husband is a preacher and we moved to Reno where, uh, out west where things aren't as black and white as they are in the south. <laughs> there are people with a myriad of views and I started questioning some things that I'd always been taught. Um, this, the Church of Christ is, um, they have one basic way of viewing scripture that defines everything else. And the, the, the overriding principle is, where's your authority? You have to have authority for what you do. And the way we glean authority from the New Testament, <coughs> the New Testament only, is uh, by commands, examples, and necessary inferences. The problem I began to see with that was we pick and choose which examples we bind and require for salvation. For instance, we have an example of Paul in Acts 20 verse 7 meeting in an upper room and preaching till midnight. And presumably he took the Lord's Supper. It says that he broke bread. We assume it was the Lord's Supper. And it was on the first day of the week. And because of that, that means that the Church of Christ partakes the Lord's Supper every Sunday because the first day of the week happens once a week. So you should take it every week. And I personally think that that's a great idea. It's a good practice. But where the Church of Christ, I believe, goes too far is that they say, well, you have to do it that way or you're going to hell. You're sinning. But there are examples such as foot washing, lifting up holy hands, holy kiss, um, 
other things like that that we don't bind because they seem odd for our culture, which I also think is a pretty good idea. But where, where do we get the authority from God to bind examples? I don't see in the Old Testament or the New Testament anywhere where God punished someone or expressly stated examples are to be followed for salvation. There are verses where Paul says, imitate me, follow my example. But he's not talking about traveling by ship or going on missionary journeys to uh, Asia Minor or um, Europe. He's speaking of his way of life, his, his conduct, his character. And so those verses are skewed to mean that we can bind examples, and really that's taking them out of context. So as I began to look at these things, some other things were happening where I was studying the book of Romans, and this concept of grace kept popping up. And grace is one of those subjects that's not really spoken much about. When we talk about grace, here's how my dad explained it. My dad said, when I asked him about grace as a child, he said, if you do everything right for the rest of your life, you will still never deserve heaven. And that's what grace does for you. It squeaks you in when you really don't deserve it, but you've been perfect as best as you can. You get kind of pushed in. Grace is so much more than that. If you read the book of Romans, grace, I mean, why did people ask Paul, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? They ask that for a reason. And the reason they ask that is because grace covers our sins. And that's not licensed to sin, as Paul said. It's not licensed to sin, but it's a beautiful thing. The, the cleansing of Jesus' blood in First John. There are things that we never spoke of that are so freeing. The gospel is a message of liberty. It's a message of freedom. Not to sin, not to use your liberty for vice, but to, through love to serve one another. And I realized we had been creating sins where there weren't any. The style and manner that you worship is not expressly laid out in scripture. It's not. And verses that are encouraging, like, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's a beautiful exhortation. It helps us to sing. But the Church of Christ takes that and make, turns it into a rule. Like, oh, there, you can only sing. There's no authority for instrumental music. And as I'm learning this about grace, something else happened. I started to experience real love. Unconditional love. As a parent, when my children mess up, when they do the wrong thing, some, even if they do it on purpose, they're punished but they're not kicked out of the family. If when they're older, they choose to walk away from the family, there's really not much I can do but wait for them to come back. But like the father and the prodigal son, I will run to them if they choose to come back. To me, God created the family to show us how much he loves us and how he treats us. There are consequences to sin, no doubt. But does that mean you're kicked out of the family every time you make a mistake? Every time I get angry or lose my temper or I'm greedy or I'm guilty of pride, God just automatically kicks me out of the family and i got to keep getting back in? I don't believe that's the case. And this unconditional love that started to spring up in my heart, it made me realize that God never expected me to be perfect. Jesus knows how hard it is to be human. And he's at the throne of God. And he's telling God, it's hard. It's hard to be human. And this life is not meant to be about rules and regulations. That's what happened in the Old Testament. And Peter says, neither they nor their fathers were able to bear such a covenant. It was too hard. And Jesus came and shed his blood to free us. So to my Church of Christ brothers and sisters who might be watching, I would ask you, are you free? Are you really free? Or are you weighed down by fear? 
by the pursuit of perfection. Jesus came to, to free us. And it's a beautiful thing. And he loves us desperately. No matter what we do. When my kids make a mistake, it doesn't make me love them less. I'm there encouraging them and cheering them on. Get back up. Keep trying. And so I hope, I hope my story can encourage you to keep going and to really recognize the love of Jesus for what it is. The sacrifice that he paid took all of God's wrath. He's not saving any for any of us. 